Beloved community, grace and peace to you from our Creator, who rejoices the heart and revives the soul. Whether you are part of First Church, a joyful and justice-seeking community in the heart of our nation's capital, or whether you are a guest or friend joining us from many different locations, we welcome you to worship on this Indigenous Peoples Sunday as we conclude our fall theme, Renewing the Journey. So attune to the spirit and move as you feel moved. Bring the fullness of who you are to this hour of worship, for wide is God's welcome. I want to call your attention to the bulletin insert you received in your worship folder today. We are inviting all of you to join with congregations across our region, calling on our leaders to guide our communities in creating healthier homes and neighborhoods, especially for those most impacted by pollution and climate change. So please feel free to fill out the bottom portion and leave it in the offering plate on your way out or take it home with you to learn more. And following worship, all are invited to join us for fellowship and coffee in the narthex, followed by an important community listening session facilitated by artist Je Jessica Valoris as we excavate the hidden history of the enslaved laborers who worked the land on which our church now sits. I hope you will join us in person or on Zoom. Friends, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome into the shared experience of worshiping the God whose love knows no bounds. So let us worship together, beginning with our land acknowledgement led by Lindsay Swisher, our assistant moderator. At the confluence of the Potomac and Anacostia rivers, we worship on the grounds of the ancestral homelands of the Piscataway Kanoi tribe the people where the rivers blend, and of the Natchitank Anacostan people. We light this candle to honor their struggle to survive, their resistance and resilience in the face of land appropriation and cultural suppression, and the enduring spirit of the diverse native communities represented by those who make their home in this area today.
Please join me in the prayer of confession. Great Spirit, we confess that the human family has strayed from the sacred way, the way of love, respect, gratitude, and reverence for all of life. We know that we are the ones who are divided, and we are the ones who must come back together to walk the sacred way, the way of love, respect, gratitude, and reverence for all of life. Sacred One, teach us love, compassion, and honor that we might be a source of healing for all of creation. Amen. And hear these words of restoration. As surely as the rain comes forth to water the earth, God's mercy comes to us as a gift, abundant and freely given. The same God who created the cosmos and raised Jesus from death to life brings healing and forgiveness to the world today. You are loved. You are restored. In Christ, you are made new. Thanks be to God. And now I invite us to all rise if you are able and to share the peace of Christ with one another as we strive to be the beloved community of love and shalom. May the peace of Christ be with you. Peace, everybody. Peace, everybody. God's peace. Peace. Happy Sunday. Peace, everybody. Hi, Eric with Varon. Good to see you. Peace, everybody. Peace, everyone. Everybody. Good morning. Peace. 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 Good morning. everybody. Peace. Peace. Peace, John. Peace.
Good morning. This morning's scripture reading is from Exodus 20, 1 through 20. Then God spoke, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses God's name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that your Lord, your God, is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female enslaved person, ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the peoples witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. They were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses replied, do not be afraid for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of God upon you so that you do not sin. The second reading is from the letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, verses 4 through 14. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surprising value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. Siblings, I do not consider that I have laid hold of it, but one thing I have laid hold of, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal, toward the prize of the heavenly call of God, in Christ Jesus. Will you pray with me? God of all our journeys, speak in this place. In the calming of our minds and the longing of our hearts, by the words of our lips and in the thoughts that we form, speak, O oh God, for your people are listening. Amen. 
As a trained facilitator, I have learned not to begin sacred conversations on racism with the sin and trauma of attempted genocide and slavery. When we speak of racial healing and repair, we must return to communities which were whole and thriving before the harm to people rooted in the African motherland or the vast prairies we now call the Americas. We must recall the shape of creative expression, the sacred rituals, songs, and dances. We must remember their stories. To begin, we must go all the way back before human existence to creation accounts which tell of God's spirit brooding over the face of the deep, bringing out of chaos the order of dawning day and setting sun. It's crucial to begin the story here. We share one creator, we are born of the same substance as the fish of the sea and the wild animals who roam the land, who have inhabited this earth longer than we have. To remember our place, as poet Mary Oliver says, in the family of living things. So I want to begin this morning with a story. In her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, native scientist Robin Wall Kimmerer describes the ritual burning of the headland by indigenous people as they welcomed home the prodigal salmon. Each year, the women would sew another row of shells on their dress. The people would pile wood and sharpen huckleberry skewers. Elders mending nets would sing the songs of old. All around the meadow, they would build nests of cedar bark and twisted grass covered in coal and feed it with breath. Smoke would erupt into flame, a crackling ring of fire that quickened across the headland of the coast. The fire, Kimmerer writes, was meant to say to the salmon, come, flesh of my flesh, my siblings, return to the river where your lives began. We have made a feast in your honor. As the legend goes, what began as a pinprick of light would flare into a tower of fire reflecting on the water, glinting off silver scales as the salmon as one body turned toward the east. A song of praise would pierce the air as the food swam up the river fin to fin. Four days of fish would course by in great throngs, spared to carry the message to their upriver relatives that the people were grateful and full of respect. Then, the most honored fisher would take the first salmon to be prepared with ritual care. The people would feast, dance, sing, and give thanks. The salmon, Kimmerer notes, brought a much needed resource for the trees, nitrogen. Salmon carcasses would be dragged into the forest by bears and eagles fertilizing the trees. Salmon fed everyone. Only fragments of the story remain. Kimmerer writes, the people who knew it were lost before their knowledge could be captured and the death was too thorough to leave many tellers behind. In our Exodus text this morning, the Ten Commandments, we hear a prelude to the legal doctrines which would justify theft of these ancestral homelands. If you read closely, you can hear it in the language of ownership. You shall not covet your neighbor's property. 
And listed there as property is house, ox, donkey, also slaves and wives. The law is laid down in thunder and smoke, and Moses claims its purpose is to strike fear into the faithful so they would not sin. Fear-based, property-centered, defining right there in the scripture a hierarchy of power in which men are second only to God. It's not too difficult to see how this law translated into religious justification to plunder. It was in the name of Jesus that Europeans first colonized the New World. Under the doctrine of discovery articulated in a series of papal bulls, white settlers began claiming ownership of the ancestral homelands cultivated by native tribes for thousands of years. One excerpt reads, quote, we have learned that you chose our beloved son, Christopher Columbus, whom you furnished with ships and men equipped to make diligent quest. And they, with divine aid and the utmost diligence, discovered remote islands and even mainlands that hitherto had not been discovered, wherein dwell very many peoples living in peace. These very people seem sufficiently disposed to embrace the Catholic faith in order that you may enter upon so great an undertaking, we give grant and assign to you and your heirs all their dominions, camps, and villages, and all rights, jurisdictions, all islands and mainlands discovered and to be discovered, unquote. The doctrine of discovery and the religious justification it provided inspired the Monroe Doctrine, which declared U.S. dominance over the Western Hemisphere, and Manifest Destiny, which catalyzed westward expansion. Despite the fact that First Peoples saved the lives of early colonists by sharing food and knowledge, white settlers would spend the next 300 years perpetrating war, stealing land, and breaking treaties. From forced removal from their homelands to boarding schools that separated parents from children to the attempt to eradicate native languages and rituals, our nation's forefathers systematically dehumanized native tribes and they did so in the name of Jesus Christ. At the General Synod, of the United Church of Christ in June, a resolution passed calling us to examine the role of our predecessors in establishing Native American boarding schools and to discern how we will repair the harm for current and future generations. I served on the Committee of Delegates examining this issue, and I learned that nine out of 10 Americans have no idea these boarding schools existed. Yet one of my fellow committee members said of his Ho-Chunk community, I don't know anyone not personally touched by the boarding school system. In our faith, however, the law does not have the last word. It is fully realized, according to Jesus, only through the gospel of love. In Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, the doctrine of ownership is subverted by a doctrine of relinquishment. Paul had reason to boast in his standing as an expert in religious law and one blameless under it as not only an Israelite, but also a Roman citizen and a Pharisee who strictly upheld the orthodoxy of his faith. Before he was knocked off his high horse on the road to Damascus, Paul was known by the name given him at birth, Saul. Saul despised anything that polluted or watered down his religious tradition, and he believed the church of Jesus Christ did just that. So with zeal, he set out to persecute the church. What I'm telling you 
is Saul promoted and perpetrated religious violence. He fanned the flames of religious hierarchy and authoritarianism. And let me be clear here. There are people in every religion who do this. They cling to their beliefs until their hearts are calcified. Differences become intolerable. They hijack religion and fashion it into a vehicle of dominance. I don't know if we should be mortified or amazed that so much of our scriptures are authored by someone who practiced religion in this way before he was rescued by the gospel of love, before he was forgiven and ministered to and gentled into a flawed apostle who struggled to rein in his boasting and declarative mastery of doctrine. But here we have it. And from an imperfect source, a gospel of love which subverts the law of ownership. Whatever gains I had, Paul declares, I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. The message interpretation puts it like this. The very credentials people are waving around as something special, I'm tearing them up. All the things I once thought were so important are gone from my life. I don't want some petty, inferior brand of righteousness that comes from keeping a list of rules when I could get the robust kind that comes from trusting Christ, experiencing his resurrection power, partnering in his suffering, and going all the way with him to death itself. In April of 2016, Native American tribes gathered at Standing Rock, a vortex, of spiritual rebirth and prophetic resilience to remind the world that in the words of Chief Leonard Crow Dog, we do not own the land, the land owns us. Our fidelity to the earth, our careful stewardship of living upon it, our humble place in the family of all living things is essential for the survival of our children and grandchildren. We were created for this. That December, in a stunning show of repentance and solidarity, veterans, led by Wesley Clark Jr., stood before the Council of Tribes gathered at Standing Rock and spoke these words. Quote, Many of us are from units that have hurt you. Over the years, we came, we fought you, we took your land, we signed treaties that we broke, we stole minerals from your sacred hills, blasted the faces of our presidents on your sacred mountain, we took your children. We tried to take the language that the Creator gave you. We've come to say that we are sorry. We are at your service and we beg for your forgiveness. Unquote. This moment of stark truth telling in an era of fake news was profound. As Wes Clark Jr. begged for forgiveness, a small group of veterans knelt down, some bending at the waist and bowing until their hands touched the ground. This pregnant moment was punctuated by the ululations of tribal tongues crying out. This same shrill wailing can mark moments of grief, or those of exuberant joy. Perhaps in this case, it was both. 
as I heard that sound rise in the bright air, just as the chief placed his hand on the bowed head of Wesley Clark Jr., as I heard the chief call for world peace, thinking always beyond this one place and time, as I heard him say that we don't own the land, the land owns us, I thought, yes, the same is true for grace. We don't own grace. Grace owns us. God's grace is far wider than we can imagine. It is not ours to own, but it is always there calling us to relinquish the doctrine of ownership, calling us back to the sacred worth we share with all that lives and breathes, calling us to the holy work of repair. So beloved siblings, let us strain forward to what lies ahead. Let us press on toward the goal, that holy call of grace made known in Jesus Christ. Amen.
Amen. On the second Sunday of every month, we take up a special offering that is dedicated toward an organization doing the work of justice and peace that is at the heart of who we are as a community as well. And this Sunday, our, the recipient of our second Sunday special offering, which you can find in your worship folder, is the Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. In just a moment, we will watch a short video. Uh, you can also read more about them in your worship folder. Uh, but before we do that, I want to remind you of the easiest ways to give. If you are here in the sanctuary, there is an offering plate and a QR code on your way out. Please feel free to leave your offering there. Um, if you are joining us on Zoom, please click on the link that will take you to our donate page on our website. You can give there through Vanco or PayPal. We always uh, welcome folks to send checks in to the mail. If you are specifically giving to the second Sunday offering, I would ask that you include that in the memo portion of your check or in the drop down menu if you are giving online. Uh, we truly appreciate your gifts and the way that these gifts in particular will go toward this partnering with this wonderful coalition that is bringing about healing for all of those who have suffered because of the Native American boarding schools that were instituted in our nation's history. Uh, as soon as we watch this video, following that, I would invite you to rise in body or in spirit to join us for the doxology. Verse 1, we will all sing together. Verse 2 will be sung in Lakota by soloist Abigail Chipperoni. And so now uh, let us view the video. They changed their motto from the only good Indian is a dead one to kill the Indian but save the man. When they forced us to go to boarding school, they told us to let all that was Indian within us die. The National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition was formed to bring truth, justice, and healing for boarding school survivors and descendants in the United States. The time for healing is now. I was placed in the boarding school, or I ended up at the boarding school one night uh, when I was about six years old. The boarding school was St. Joe's Academy in 1968. I actually thought I was going to be free, uh, but the, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs lady and her husband were were right there to pick me up, and aside from having a place to sleep and uh, having, having three meals a day, uh, I don't have a whole lot of good things to say about the boarding school. Then the boarding school was really affected my self-esteem, um, not wanting to know the language, not really involved in the ceremonies, and just to being proud of who I was. You know, we're, we're taught we're not supposed to do certain things, but I ask myself, well, where did that come from? Why are we fearful sometimes? Those kinds of teachings come from the military part of our experience, but I've had to take myself to places beyond some of those borders that I've taught work and when I was able to do that, it was just a sense of relief. I think the coming generations have a lot of responsibility. It was our generation that became aware of the need for healing. to make us into white people by cutting our hair and then taking our language and all the horrific things that happened in other places but 
it's in here. It's still here. It's strong as ever, and I'm going to pass it on. It's important to educate the people on what you do know in, in all areas, <laughs> not just the history and the, the trauma that our people went through, but how beautiful our people were. The boarding school experience made me very angry. And I stayed angry, but the context in which I passed that anger into the future, I want it to be better. I'm happy about is my grandchildren won't be able to experience some of the things that I've witnessed, a lot of the people that I've grew up witness. When I think about healing and once we are able to put aside, you know, some of these major issues that have impacted us uh, in Indian country. To me, it's about being more in control of who we are as indigenous people of this land. Go on a hill fast, you know, do something, uh, because all of those, all of those things that um, the boarding school was put in place for, to take away, to strip us of our culture. You failed. With me, you failed. we come together in prayer. And before I lead us in prayer, I'd like to, to welcome any of you to, to uplift prayers of celebration or concern that you might want to share with the community here. Are there any prayers people would like to lift up? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I'd like to lift up my father-in-law, W.A. Hayward. He was in a really bad car accident about 10 weeks ago. He is still in the hospital, and we are, uh, my husband and his brother are just working with what is, comes next for their dad, because it doesn't look like going home is gonna be an option. Oh, so would you be sorry. We'll keep father-in-law in our prayers. Here, Kurt. I'd like to ask a prayer 
for peace and reconciliation for the people of Israel and Palestine. Amen. Pray for peace in Israel and Palestine, all around the world. Any other prayers we'd like to lift up? Nora. Prayers for a, uh, a high school friend who I just got back in touch with, um, who's, who's had a, a very serious surgery, and then he has come out of it well, which so that's, I'm very grateful for that. And also just want to celebrate this beautiful day. And um, I, I brought some, some of these uh, native asters that grow about 10 feet tall, and there's a bunch of them in my backyard, and I just had to bring some and just celebrate that they're the last food the bees get before they hunker down and then go to sleep for the winter. Um, prayers of comfort for my friend. Her cousin was recently hit in a, um, in a hit and run, and he was young. He was um, only 16, so. I'd like to um, have prayers of thanksgiving for my friend Yvonne who had lung transplant last Sunday and she's uh, walking now. so um, it's successful thus far Amen. It's for Yvonne's healing and recovery and path forward Amanda you had a prayer Yesterday was the 15th anniversary of my father's death. And so I just give thanks for the love that he showered on me, for the ways that he taught me that I could be anything I wanted to be. And his legacy continues, I think, to live in my family. So I'm full of gratitude. Amen. The legacy is living on radiantly. Um, prayers for Katie Sharp. She's a lovely eight-year-old girl whose dads are beloved friends of ours. She is at Children's Hospital with a serious eye infection. So we want to lift up Katie. We also want to pray, offer prayers of traveling mercies for Michael Hopkins, who's with his U.S. Marine Corps band, bringing joy to all the towns in the Midwest. And we're so grateful the government didn't shut down so that Michael could do that. And I think he even has a solo. So we, uh, we, we offer thanksgivings for Michael. Um, loving God, let us come to, prayer, to, to, to you in prayer. As the colors of the fall begin to change in their radiant oranges and reds, let it remind us that each of us, radiant in all our splendor, beloved fully, is made in your image. We offer thanks to you, O God, on this day as we honor the Piscataway, Kanoi, and the Anascotten and the Natchunk peoples who cared for their families and built their homes right here along the Anacostia and the Potomac. We pray that we honor them by living lives of compassion and healing, service and love. Our hearts break often these days. We pray for the prayers, we offer prayers for the people who are recovering from the earthquake in Afghanistan. And our hearts are shattered as we hear more about senseless death and destruction in places like Israel and Ukraine. We see pictures of women and children next to buildings torn by missiles of destruction. We ask why. God, you know that there is no room in this world for hate or violence. Please transform all of our hearts into hearts of reconciliation and peace where even in our disagreements, we are led by seeing the humanity of one another. On this day, O Holy One, we ask that you bless the peacemakers, peacemakers like Iranian activist Narjez Mohammed, who recently was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize despite being imprisoned for her activism by speaking up for the rights of women, for education, fair treatment, and the abolition of death penalty. We lift up peacemakers here in, in cities like D.C. who are disruption makers, who are trying to stop the violence 
and to show that youth in D.C. and other cities that there is another way. We lift up the words of St. Francis. Lord, make us an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, let us sow pardon. And as our hearts focus on the Middle East, especially in the aftermath of all the, that happened yesterday, I want to lift up the words of Holocaust survivor and activist Elie Wiesel, who wrote this in his Nobel Peace Prize speech. And then I explained how naive we were, that the world did not know and remain silent, and that as I swore never to be silent, whenever and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation, we must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes we must interfere. When human lives are endangered, when human dignity is in jeopardy, national borders and sensitivities become irrelevant. Wherever men or women or siblings are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place, at that moment, must become the center of the universe. Let it be so, O oh Lord. Carry our tears. So in comfort and solace, I invite you to join me in the First Nations version of the prayer of the Savior. I will read the one, and you will read the many. O great Spirit, our Father from above, Bring your good road to us. Provide for us day by day the elk, the buffalo, and the salmon. Release us from the things we have done wrong. Guide us away from the things that tempt us to stray from your good road. Aho, may it be so. Amen.
seated. Before our final blessing, I want to remind you to check our website, e-newsletter, and social media pages for announcements. If you are a new guest worshiping with us today who would like to stay connected to the life of our church, I would invite you to complete a blue visitor's card. Freda is holding those up at the back. Thank you, Freda. And for any newcomers joining us by Zoom, you can find the digital form, visitor's information, Information form um, in a link in your worship folder. I hope you will complete that to stay connected with us. And now for a few announcements. Don't forget to place your completed bulletin insert in the offering plate on your way out. Join us in the narthex for coffee and fellowship, followed by a hybrid community listening session with artist Jessica Valores in the community hall, in which we will discuss the hidden history of enslaved laborers who worked the land on which our church sits. Please join us either in person or on Zoom using this same Zoom link. I want to thank all who made today's service possible. Tom Sowers on sound, Kim Darling, our Zoom moderator who also served as a scripture reader along with David Greer, our usher team of Freda Sparks and Matthew Lagama, Kamisha Thomas, our Sunday morning coordinator, Nora Marsh for bringing these beautiful native asters for all of us to enjoy, the First Church Choir under the direction of Leela Coyle our liturgist, Lindsay Swisher, who will also host our coffee hour with Meg McGuire. And now for our final blessing adapted from a Native American proverb. Beloved community, walk tall as the trees, live strong as the mountains, be gentle as the spring winds. Keep the warmth of the summer sun in your heart. And the Great Spirit be with you always. Aho and amen.